Believe it or not, our ancient ancestors were once covered head to toe in fur, not too different from our primate cousins. But over millions of years, something extraordinary happened. We started losing that fur, transforming into the mostly hairless humans we are today. So what triggered this dramatic change? Was it just a way to beat the heat? Or is there more to the story? Let's dig into the fascinating journey of how and why humans lost their fur. Now, hair might seem like a small detail, but it plays a big role in both biology and identity. Like all mammals, we started out using hair to manage our body temperature, shield ourselves from the sun, and even sense our surroundings. That fine fuzz on your arms? It actually helps detect things like a breeze or nearby movement. Early humans used that kind of sensitivity to stay alert and avoid danger. From an evolutionary standpoint, the kind of hair we had depended a lot on where we lived. In cold areas, humans grew thicker, denser hair for warmth. But in hotter climates, having less hair helped our bodies cool off more efficiently. It was all about surviving in the environment. But somewhere along the line, hair took on a whole new role. It stopped being just about survival and started becoming a way to express who we are. These days, your hairstyle can say a lot. Your personality, your culture, your fashion sense, even your attitude. Whether it's a sleek new cut, a vibrant color, or rocking your natural texture, hair has become a major form of self-expression. On the flip side, losing hair or dealing with changes in texture can really affect how we see ourselves. That's why so many people turn to treatments, styling tricks, or hair restoration methods to stay confident and keep that youthful edge. It's wild to think that in today's world, where hair is part of our personal identity, we humans used to be covered in a thick layer of fur. So, what exactly happened? To figure that out, we need to understand how hair actually grows. Hair growth is a pretty complex dance between your genes, hormones, and even the environment around you. But here's the simple version. Each hair grows from a tiny structure in your skin called a follicle. Inside that follicle, cells divide rapidly and push older cells up and out, creating the hair strand you see. The pattern, thickness, and speed of your hair growth, all dictated by your DNA. And it's this intricate system that evolution has fine-tuned over time to give us the hair, or lack of it, we have today. Your hair is made of keratin, a super strong protein that gives it durability and structure. And when it comes to how hair grows, it doesn't just shoot out all at once, it actually happens in stages. There are three main phases. The anagen phase, which is when your hair is actively growing. The catagen phase, a short transitional period and the telogen phase, where hair takes a break and eventually falls out. Then, the cycle starts all over again. Now here's where it gets interesting. How long your hair can grow really depends on how long that anagen or growth phase lasts. For some folks, it's only a couple of years, which means their hair naturally stays shorter. But for others, that phase can stretch out much longer, allowing their hair to grow way down their back. And yeah, you can thank or blame your parents for that. Genetics play a huge role in how long, thick, or fast your hair grows. But genetics aren't the only player in the game. Hormones also have a huge say. Take puberty, for example. Testosterone levels shoot up in both men and women, which kicks off a wave of hair growth across the scalp, face, and body. On the flip side, hormonal shifts during things like pregnancy or menopause can make hair grow faster, slower, or start falling out altogether. Even your lifestyle gets involved. Stress, what you eat, and your overall health can mess with your hair's growth cycle. So if your hair's thinning or you're noticing changes, it might be your body trying to send a message. Now let's step back and ask, why do we grow hair in certain places like our scalp and face? but not all over our bodies like most mammals. That takes us deep into our evolutionary past. Scalp hair, for one, helps protect us from the sun and regulate our body temperature, especially in hot environments. Facial hair, especially in men, may have evolved as a visual signal of maturity or strength, 
possibly playing a role in attraction or dominance displays. As for body hair, back in the day, it was like built-in gear against sunburn, bug bites, and even skin chafing. It served a purpose. So then, here's the million dollar question. If body hair was so useful, why did we start losing it? Well, it's a long story, but it all started over a million years ago. The shift didn't happen overnight. It was a slow transformation that played out across hundreds of thousands of years, driven by climate changes, genetic tweaks, and new ways of living. Based on fossil records, DNA research, and clues from ancient environments, scientists believe our fur started disappearing somewhere between 2 million and 1.7 million years ago. Before that, early human relatives like Australopithecus were likely covered in a thick coat of fur, similar to modern apes. Living in warm climates and without tools like fire to stay warm, that fur was critical. It acted as a natural insulator, helping them retain heat during cold nights and sudden temperature drops. But everything began to change with the rise of Homo erectus around 1.7 million years ago. This new species was built for a different lifestyle, one suited to life out in the open savannas of Africa. And with that shift came new evolutionary pressures that slowly pushed us toward the smoother skinned species we are today. So let's talk about one of the biggest game changers in human evolution, trading in our full body fur for a more streamlined, nearly naked look. Evidence shows that early humans, especially those first few species that left the trees behind and started living on the ground, were evolving to better handle the brutal heat of their new environment. Homo erectus, in particular, had to deal with the intense sun and dry conditions of the African savanna. And in that kind of heat, having a body full of fur just didn't cut it anymore. That thick coat might have worked in shady forests, but under the blazing sun? Not so much. Losing it was probably a smart move. Here's the thing. Humans developed a super efficient way to cool off, sweating. But for sweating to really work, the body needs less insulation. And that's where fur loss came in. It wasn't just a random mutation. It was a survival strategy. Better sweat glands plus less body hair meant Homo erectus could stay active longer without overheating. Fast forward to around 1.2 million years ago, and we find solid genetic evidence for something called the MC1R gene variant. This little gene is tied to skin pigmentation, specifically darker skin tones. Why is that important? Because darker skin offers protection from harmful UV radiation. And the fact that this gene started showing up suggests something big. Our ancestors had already shed most of their body hair by then. Once that fur was gone, human skin had to step up. With so much direct sun exposure, especially in open landscapes like the savanna, the body needed a new way to defend itself. Darker skin basically became our natural sunscreen. So the rise of the MC1R variant wasn't just a fluke, it was an evolutionary response. As we lost our fur, we gained melanin-rich skin to shield us from the sun. It was nature's way of adapting to a new set of survival challenges. All signs point to this major fur loss transformation happening between 1.7 and 1.2 million years ago, right in the era of Homo erectus. This was a turning point, a moment when early humans began to look a lot more like us, at least from the neck down. But here's where things get even more interesting. Scientists still debate why we gave up our fur in the first place. One of the leading ideas? The thermoregulation hypothesis. Basically, as early humans moved into hotter, sunnier regions, staying cool became the number one priority. The theory goes that with less fur and more sweat glands, humans could manage body heat way more efficiently. And that made a huge difference in survival especially if you were chasing prey or walking long distances under the relentless African sun. Let's rewind a bit. About four million years ago, our Australopithecus ancestors started to leave the comfort of shady forests behind and step out into the wide open grasslands of East Africa. That transition meant facing totally new environmental challenges, including how to keep from overheating.
And believe it or not, a lot of it comes back to one very human trait, walking on two legs, bipedalism. That's right, we're talking about walking upright on two legs, or bipedalism. While it gave our ancestors the freedom to use their hands for tools, carrying food or holding babies, it also came with a trade-off. More of the body was now exposed to the blazing sun. And in the African savanna, that meant overheating became a real issue. This problem only got more intense around 2 million years ago, when Homo erectus stepped onto the scene. These early humans weren't just upright walkers, they were built for long distance running. Their tall frames, long limbs, and bowl-shaped pelvises weren't random quirks. They were key adaptations for something called persistence hunting, a hunting method where humans would literally chase prey for hours until it overheated and collapsed. Sound exhausting? It was, but it worked. The only catch? Running in that kind of heat builds up a ton of body heat, and if you're wearing a thick fur coat, you're in trouble. That's where losing fur gave humans a major edge. As early humans started shedding body hair, their bodies could cool off more efficiently through sweating. And this wasn't just any sweating, we're talking about an advanced system powered by eccrine sweat glands. These glands produce a light, watery sweat that evaporates quickly and pulls heat away from the skin. Compared to apocrine glands, which are more about scent than cooling, eccrine sweat glands are the real MVPs of thermoregulation. Today, the average human has between 2 and 5 million of these glands. That's about 10 times more than our primate cousins like chimpanzees. So, when Homo erectus was out chasing antelope across the savanna, that sweat wasn't just dripping for no reason. It was part of a finely tuned cooling system that helped them stay active for hours without overheating or needing to stop constantly for water. This link between fur loss and sweat gland evolution is one of the most compelling arguments behind what's known as the thermoregulation hypothesis. It's the idea that as humans adapted to hot open environments, we evolved to be better at dumping excess heat, and it made all the difference. But as with most things in science, this isn't the only theory out there. Before the thermoregulation hypothesis took center stage, there were other ideas some more out there than others. One of the more famous early theories was the aquatic ape theory. This one suggested that our ancestors went through a semi-aquatic phase, living near coastlines and swampy areas. The idea was that spending time in water led to less fur and more fat under the skin, like what we see in marine mammals. It might sound a little out there today, but some folks once seriously believed humans lost their body hair because we used to spend a lot of time in the water. According to the aquatic ape theory, the loss of fur made us more hydrodynamic, kind of like dolphins or whales, letting us move through water more smoothly. They even suggested that walking on two legs evolved from wading through shallow waters. But here's the kicker. There's just no fossil evidence to back this up. No signs that our ancestors went through a major aquatic phase. And because science likes its theories with some solid backup, most researchers have shelved this one as a fun but flawed idea. Other early theories leaned more on social explanations. One proposed that humans ditched their fur simply to look different from other primates, sort of like an evolutionary fashion statement. But again, there's no strong evidence to support that claim. Another theory mixed hygiene with attraction, suggesting that being less hairy, helped reduce parasites like lice and ticks, which in turn made people more appealing to potential mates. Uh, that one sounds a bit more reasonable. After all, nobody likes being itchy, but if hairlessness was the golden ticket to staying parasite-free, then why do other primates in parasite-heavy environments still have thick fur? In the end, these early theories fall short. Some ignore the fossil record. Others don't hold up when we compare our biology with that of other primates and most of them don't take into account the full picture, how environmental, biological, and even cultural pressures worked together to shape our evolution. That's why the thermoregulation hypothesis is currently the front runner. It's backed by fossil findings, genetic data, and what we know about how humans differ anatomically from other mammals. It gives a much more complete explanation for why we lost our fur, 
pointing to heat control as the driving force behind it all. But hold up. What if I told you that technology had a hand in this transformation too? Yep, even way back in the day, our ancestors were figuring out ways to cheat the system. And the biggest game changers? Fire and clothing. Now, no one's saying fire or clothes directly caused us to lose our fur. But once humans figured out how to stay warm using these tools, there was less need for a thick, insulating coat. That freedom to survive without fur meant natural selection didn't need to preserve it. This all started around two million years ago when early humans learned how to control fire. That single innovation, cooking food, staying warm, scaring off predators, opened the door for huge evolutionary shifts, including changes in how our bodies dealt with temperature and protection. The discovery of fire was an absolute game changer not just for cooking dinner or lighting the night, but for staying warm. Suddenly, our ancestors could gather around a fire and make it through cold nights or harsh climates where a thick fur coat used to be the only line of defense. And fire didn't just keep them cozy, it kept them safe. Flames helped fend off predators, which meant humans didn't need to rely as heavily on fur for warmth or protection anymore. Over time, individuals with less body hair weren't at a disadvantage. They could survive just fine. That opened the evolutionary door for hairlessness to take hold and spread across generations. Then came the next major milestone, clothing. Around 170,000 years ago, early humans started using animal hides and natural fibers to cover up and stay insulated. This was a massive leap. With clothing, people had a new way to defend themselves against cold, rain, wind, and even harsh sunlight. As garments became more widespread, fur became even less necessary. The ability to dress for the elements gave our ancestors more freedom to adapt physically paving the way for further reductions in body hair. But that odor isn't just random. It carries subtle chemical signals that may still play a role in social and sexual communication. Basically, scent markers that can convey things like genetic compatibility or overall health. It's primitive, sure, but it's wired deep into our biology. In the pubic region, hair works a lot like it does in the armpits. It helps trap pheromones those subtle scent signals released by apocrine glands, which may still play a role in how we connect with others socially or even sexually. But that's not its only job. Pubic hair also reduces friction, which helps protect the sensitive skin in that area during movement or physical activity. Plus, it acts as a barrier, providing a bit of defense against bacteria and other potential irritants. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. Human hair patterns might not be all about survival. They could also be influenced by sexual selection. That's right. Charles Darwin himself suggested that preferences for less body hair may have impacted who got chosen as a mate. While thermoregulation is still the top theory for why we lost most of our fur, sexual selection may have fine-tuned where hair stayed and why. Think about it. Facial hair, head hair, armpit and pubic hair. These areas may have stuck around not just because of biology, but because they also played roles in attraction, identity, and social signaling. Today, traits like thick hair on the scalp, a defined beard, or even the natural scent from sweat glands might still send subtle messages. Evolution didn't just leave us with skin. It left us with stories woven into the strands that remain.